the trip started out a lot better than that. It started out uh, a week ago Saturday, and Senator Stevens brought a number of his friends with him to join several GCI executives and our families at our fishing retreat on the Agula Walk. The people were all folks we had known from prior Stevens fishing trips, and many of them were friends of long standing. We had several days of wet but good fishing. The silvers were running strong on the Nushagak. Everybody was limiting out. There were challenging poker games at night and a lot of good camaraderie. The morning of the crash, Terry Smith flew the otter into Dillingham to drop off somebody who was returning to Anchorage and came back to the lodge. He concluded that the turbulence that morning was too significant to <clears throat> be comfortable for the passengers and recommended that we not go fish that morning. So people stayed around the lodge in front of the fire. It was kind of gray and wet outside. All the weather was better than it had been for the previous three or four days. It was also very windy. We had a late lunch, finished lunch sometime probably around 2 o'clock, and Terry concluded that the weather was sufficient and the turbulence had gone down enough that it was worth a trip over to the, the King Camp on the Nushigak. There were eight people that wanted to go, and they piled into the Otter and left early that afternoon. Shortly after they left, <clears throat> my wife and I climbed into our airplane and just went out on a pleasure flight in the area, kind of looking for some blue sky, see if we can find any sunshine. We flew probably a 60 mile radius around the area. The weather was extremely varied. It was windy, <clears throat> very turbulent at spots, but not everywhere. The weather conditions were from on the good side to as much as 25 miles of visibility and 3,000 foot overcast to on the downside low ceilings and very limited visibility up into the Togiak Mountains. We probably flew within <clears throat> a couple of miles of the crash, but we're unaware that it occurred. The weather down towards the crash at the time we flew there, which was probably somewhat after the crash, was <clears throat> not bad, but the weather was changing extremely rapidly in all of the locations out there. So what the weather we experienced on our outbound leg was different than the weather we experienced on our inbound leg. Return to the lodge, <clears throat> I spent some time messing around with a sticky knob in my, on my airplane that didn't want to behave and was just putting the, the ceiling back together when Greg Chapados came out of the lodge and said that the otter had never reached the king camp. It had, the king camp had been notified that they were coming before they left, but they didn't notify us that they hadn't arrived. <clears throat> we called there sometime after six o'clock in an attempt to figure out what time they were coming back so that we could know when to schedule dinner and that's when we learned they hadn't arrived. We quickly figured out that we had a significant abnormality, placed a couple of quick calls to places where they might have <clears throat> diverted to and then recognized that Terry knew all the emergency equipment on the airplane. He had a sat phone and he certainly would have contacted us if they had stopped somewhere and he was in a position to contact us. At that point we notified the other aircraft in the area, the air taxis, called some of our friends in Dillingham, called Dillingham Radio and said, we've got a missing aircraft. My wife went and grabbed her medical gear. We threw it into my airplane and as we launched, I told them to go ahead and call the RCC and start the formal uh, rescue process as well. We knew the route they would have flown. It's basically a highway from the terminal point on the lake where we have the lodge directly to the King Camp. It goes between, in about a mile wide valley between two hills. We started down the center of that route on a search about 20 miles from the lodge. I got a radio call from John Butra, the owner of Bristol. I'm having a brain freeze on it. He's right. one of the air services there, and he was quoted earlier. Bucra? Bucra, yeah, and Bristol Bay Air, I guess it is. My brain is not completely back together yet. I can um, imagine. Hey, Ron, I've already flown that route. Why don't you sidestep south? I sidestep north on the way back. I'm about to make another run. We diverted three miles to the left, and we're just picking up the course to parallel 
three miles or three miles south, which was right to parallel the course. And we heard a call. I got it. John had spotted it in the hill. He gave us the coordinates. We immediately headed there. We were the second airplane on site. Tom Tucker had launched right after he got the call from our folks at the lodge. He took Bob Hemshute, one of our Dillingham employees, with him, and he was just partway out of Dillingham when he heard us calling in the coordinates. He was in an R-44 helicopter. And he went directly to the site. We circled the site for a little while. We saw somebody wave from next to the site. So we knew there were survivors, or at least a survivor, and my wife immediately said, I gotta be down there on the ground. Uh, I called Tom, I said, I got a doc on board here. Where do you want to meet me so she can get on the helicopter and you can get her down there? We flew to Olegnagik, the little airstrip there, which is about five miles away from the crash site. I landed the wheel plane on the, on the runway there and he landed the helicopter at the end of the runway. We transferred Dr. Bowman and all the gear to the helicopter and she flew up to the site. I then took off again and flew back to the site hoping to act as radio relay. <clears throat> she took a emergency handheld radio to the ground with her in addition to the sat phone and I was going to relay the calls from there to the airport in Dillingham. <clears throat> I stayed on site for a little less than 40 minutes before the weather came down very, very fast and very hard and I was driven off the site to the Dillingham Airport where I then spent the night attempting to coordinate some of the rescue activities. One of my first calls was to Governor Parnell who immediately launched the full resources of the state's RCC. I spoke to General Kutznos numerous times over the night. They got the C-130 and the PayPal on the, on the route right away. Weather was challenging <clears throat> throughout the evening which complicated the efforts. Uh, General Atkins over at the Air Force Command <clears throat> facilitated the involvement of the military. Coast Guard helicopter showed up the next morning and the rest I think has been pretty clearly reported. The first access to the site was about 7 o'clock the next morning. The crews just couldn't get in there that night. By the time they got there, the weather was so down and the, the visibility so poor, they couldn't find it. The Air Guard crew that got in there flew some pretty miraculous flying to get there. They basically flew it into the clouds at a couple of hundred feet and then inched their way in a hover up the side of the mountain looking at the trees. When they got there, they couldn't see the site, but the dock and the paramedics could see them from the ground, and I listened on the CB radio as the folks on the ground called to the helicopter, okay, it's 2 o'clock, 500 yards, it's 1 o'clock, 100 yards, and they basically vectored the helicopter in because they could see the spotlight, the searchlight on the helicopter. The last thing I heard on Channel 16 was the pilot of the helicopter saying, I got it, and then they got the jumpers down to the site. Uh, within 90 minutes, they had the first survivors out, and uh, then went back for the second round of survivors, sent the Coast Guard back for the rescue personnel, and then the Air Guard went back, I think it was the Air Guard went back to get the bodies.